one second to see if we can get the video up. Oh, here we go. Okay, because we're recording this, right? Um, and I think a lot of people will watch this video, and I'm actually um, looking forward to posting it online. So, um, anyways, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Uh, we are here featuring some activists who are working in Nairobi, in Kenya. Uh, you're in, the, in this city that you guys call uh, home. And I think it will be a very fascinating discussion. Um, we, I will ask each of them to say a, a, something about their work. And then I will open it up for, I will ask a few questions of my own, and then I will open it up for questions and answers. Uh, before doing that, I just want to say a few words about what we are doing here today, and also to say a little bit about myself and UN Globe. So basically, um, for those of you who don't know, UN Globe is the staff, it's a group that represents LGBTI staff in the UN system. Uh, from agencies such as WFP to the UN Secretariat to UNHCR. Um, and we are really trying to change minds and attitudes in the UN system so that there's dialogue going on on issues related to people of diverse sexual gender identities. We want to target policies and other things that I will get more into later. But I just want to say a few things now in terms of uh, the flyer that we sent out you will see, you will have seen the word LGBTI there quite often. Um, and I just want to define LGBTI because in, in a few of the meetings I've had here, I've been asked that question. So um, LGBTI uh, stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and intersex. And I think what I do want to emphasize, and because it's something that I, that I, I believe in very much, is that um, People who identify as gay or people who identify as lesbian or as trans, this is a very specific way of understanding oneself. Um, and I think it could be said that quite often it's a very Western mode of understanding um, your sexual or emotional attractions to people of your own sex. Not all the cultures in the world have the same mode of seeing and understanding uh, sexual attractions or emotional attractions to others. Others may have a very different um, way to see this. But, um, and it's not, I'm not talking about it in terms of translation, as in um, that being, that the word gay is in other cultures, in other countries, is, is, is said differently. I'm talking about the, the very mode of seeing and understanding that is different. And I think that is worth acknowledging. Um, I think ultimately what the commonality that all these uh, different people share is that um, they understand themselves to be different from the mainstream. And I think that this difference, and the, obviously all the advocacy that is going on around the world, is to ensure that difference does not mean that you're targeted, criminalized, punished, sent to jail, uh, put to death. There's a lot of uh, advocacy work that is needed, and I think that the United Nations should be at the forefront of that advocacy, uh, arguing advocating for diversity and inclusion, arguing that difference does not mean um, death. Because the UN, one of the funding documents of the UN is the human, is human rights, right? Uh, the, human, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is one of the founding documents of the UN. And if the UN does not speak up for the right of every individual to be free and to, and to have a set of rights respected, I can't think of any other organization that would. And in terms of what UN Globe is doing, well, we believe that if we are going to, if the UN is, it wants to be advocating for diversity and inclusion everywhere, it should practice what it preaches at home. It stands on stronger ground when it has internalized diversity and inclusion. Unfortunately, in the UN, we are not there yet. Hopefully, we will be. And what UN Globe is trying to do is we are trying to not only argue for a culture of diversity and inclusion that drives the UN from within, but also to ensure that every staff member has equality of opportunity. It doesn't matter what your background is, what your sexual or gender identity may be, whether you're a person with disabilities, a woman, um, a person of color, 
we want to ensure that everyone has equality of opportunity. And in terms of what LGBTI staff face, and, and in terms of the advocacy work that we are doing, there are many, we're working on many different fronts. Uh, we target policies. For example, mobility is one of the key policies that we're targeting. Uh, depending on which organization you work for, an LGBTI staff member may be moved from one country to another to another where, for example, uh, same-sex conduct is criminalized or cross-dressing is criminalized. And if you do this every, for like 10 years, uh, you know, it begins to wear down on you. And we believe that this should be addressed. Another aspect of, uh, of the policies that we have is the parental leave. We want to see those parental leave policies change. We want to see one parental leave policy for all parents. Because right now, um, in terms of the parental leave policies that we do have, mothers get four months, fathers get one month, which sends a message that mothers, it's a mother's job to raise children, to be the nurturer, while the father's job is to be the breadwinner. And this is why the father only gets one month while the mother gets four months. Or we have a policy where if you adopt a child and this child, even if it's a newborn child, you only get two months. But if you give birth to your child, you get, you get four months. And we think this sends the wrong message. It sends the, the message that uh, because you are adopted, you are not deserving of that crucial um, time that you need uh, at the beginning with a parent. So we want to see one parental leave policy. So we are UN Globe is targeting policies. We are targeting as well the culture. We want a dialogue on sexual or gender identities. This is where this panel discussion is important. And we are also um, asking senior leaders to speak up for equality, to speak up for the respect uh, of the rights of everyone. We are going to do, uh, in the near future, a survey where we are going to ask every staff member to tell us about what they feel about serving for the UN, whether as an LGBTI staff member or as a staff member who's serving with LGBTI staff. So we want to capture attitudes within the UN in terms of sexual or gender diversity. So I think that will be that can yield really fascinating results in terms of, because we'll be comparing one agency and against the other and to see where we are at. So there's a lot of work being done in terms of what UN Globe is doing. But as I said earlier, the main thing is to really establish a culture of diversity and inclusion. We, I personally would like to see, for example, um, a black woman who identifies as queer who starts at the UN at the G3 level. I would like to see this person become a USG, the head of UNHCR 20 or 30 years from now. And we can only do that if everyone has the equality of opportunity to do so. So um, if you are, if you do identify as LGBTI or, or you know, anywhere within that uh, uh, sexual or gender diversity spectrum, I hope you will join UN Globe, even if you are not LGBTI, but if you do believe in the work that we're doing, in trying to really ensure that the UN becomes um, an advocate for people everywhere and for their right, then I think you should join us as well. Uh, UNglobe.org is our website and you can find out how to join us. In terms of today's event, we have some great activists who are working here in Nairobi. Um, the idea at the beginning was to have Half the panel be LGBTI activists working in Nairobi, the other half being LGBTI staff in Nairobi who would share with you what their experience is like. Now, I think it's quite telling that even after weeks and weeks of effort and being put in touch with many different people, not a single one of them was willing to come here and speak. And I think it speaks to a certain fear that they have that um, the minute they participate in this panel, they will face repercussions, hostilities, that um, people who used to be friendly to you and knew you as a person who loved music or loved art or loved sports, all of a sudden 
would only see you as a gay person and would shun you because of it. So, um, but that's okay, and hopefully, you know, slowly by slowly, you know, step by step, we will create that, that kind of, um, I guess, environment where within the UN, no matter what country uh, the office is in, within the UN, um, these issues do not matter, and there truly is a culture of diversity and inclusion. So um, let me just introduce first, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to say a few words about the work that they do. Um, and I'm gonna first start with Kevin Wachiro, who is a writer, a journalist. He recently wrote a book called Invisible Stories from Kenya's Queer Community. And it's a book about those who have dedicated their lives fighting for the rights of LGBTI people in Kenya. So, Kevin. Thank you very much. Um, now that you've said that, I really don't know what else to say about myself. Um, good afternoon. My name, as you've heard, is Kevin Mochiro. Uh, my claim to fame was that book, Invisible, which was launched um, three years ago. Um, I came out in Kenya. It was my first public coming out. Um, the book did receive a lot of coverage, um, but yes, I, I have been involved in the movement from almost 10 years ago. Um, and the movement has come a long way. Um, I sort of work from the back and not in the front line like my colleagues here, but Kenya's come a long way in the 10 years, 10, 11 years that I have been directly and indirectly been involved in this movement and thank you for having me here. Okay, well thank you Kevin. Um, and I'm gonna then uh, pass it to Muticia who uh, works for Uhai Yashri. I mean, I may not be, not be pronouncing this correctly, <laughs> but um, he is a social justice, social justice activist. And Uhai Yashri is an indigenous activist fund uh, which provides resources to activists who are working in sexuality, health, and human rights in several countries, uh, among them Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda and Burundi. And starting last year, Ethiopia, and oh, starting okay. this year, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so yeah, my name is Maticia, and I have a block. Like I was, uh, I just have to say this to be able to move on. When I walked in with Njeri, I was telling her that as a kid, I used to think that the world is so problematic and I look forward to like navigating through the problems of the world. And then when I'm done fighting and trying to make the world a fairer place, I'm gonna work at the UN. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> when I got the invitation to be on this panel, I was a bit shocked and confused because it's, I was talking to you when, I, when we first got this invite and I was like, wait, the UN needs support talking about yeah. inclusion? Yeah. Like if, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> I guess you're not going to work here. <laughs> so, thanks for messing up my childhood dreams. Um, so, right now, before I get to my dream, um, I work at Uhai, and we are contributing to LGBTI and sex worker inclusion and diversity across Eastern Africa by funding work. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening, and I, you'll find out from my colleagues in Jerry and Gaido what they're doing actively in terms of organizing. Um, but our contribution to the strife is by changing that narrative and changing that perception that human rights struggles and social good in Africa is paid for by the West. So we are actually contributing and showing how Africans are making money and paying for equality and human rights. Uh, thank you so much, Muticia. And yeah, definitely, I, I, I mean, uh, you know, uh, hopefully your childhood dream <laughs> was not completely killed, but we, we will get there. I, but I think what, what you say is a very good point, you know, um, and this is the, the point that I'm, I make and UN Globe also makes is, is if it's not the UN, who would it be? So, um, and we will get there, hopefully. Um, so let me pass it on to Wariguru, who works for, who's a human rights uh, lawyer in NGLHRC, which stands for the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission. It was founded in 2012, 
and it works towards encouraging diversity and public dialogue on sex, sexuality, gender, and non-conformity in Kenya. And they also advocate for the meaningful participation of LGBTIQ individuals in Kenyan society. So over to you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Guy Sawaruguru. I work at the National Gay and Lesbian um, Human Rights Commission. I am in charge of research and documentation, and our work is essentially to fight for inclusion every day to provide a safe space for sexual minorities in Kenya to come and obtain legal aid as well as conduct advocacy across the country to try and change social attitudes towards sexual minorities and as um, Alfonso mentioned, to encourage um, progressive thinking and inclusion within our country. Okay, okay thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Gaitho. Um, I'm going to pass it over to our last but not least um, panelist, Nijeri, uh, who is actually the head of the legal department of the NGLR NGLHRC. Yes, you, you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Wow. So the people at the event are hungry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Njeri Gateru. I, as um, introduced, I, I work for the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, uh, particularly work for the legal team. And I was going to say that I spend a lot of my time in police stations, and I realized, oh, wait, that's no longer true. So guys over here uh, runs around in police stations and goes and collects queers who've been arrested for just basically existing. But uh, our work is uh, largely provision of legal aid, uh, making sure that people who've been arrested or discriminated against or violated because of their sexual orientation uh, get redressed. So we have a daily legal aid clinic. Uh, we defend people in court. We take the Kenyan government to court. Uh, we've done that three times. We're really good at it. Uh, yeah, just do a lot of litigation work towards uh, equality for all persons, and particularly our focus being uh, sexual and gender minorities in Kenya. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Nijeri. And just to clarify, um, according to the website that I saw, uh, you, uh, she's a queer black feminist, I should add that, a woman, a human rights lawyer. Um, yes, proudly. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions, and then we will pass it over to you uh, to ask any question you would like to any of the panelists here. Um, let me ask one question to each of the panelists before that, uh, and I will start with Kevin. And I want to ask Kevin what you think is the biggest challenge uh, or other, the big challenges that people of diverse sexual or gender identities uh, face in Kenya. And I was also wondering if you could also talk a little bit about uh, any security threats uh, that they may face. Okay. Um. I'll just tell my, my own story in order to help answer that question. Uh, when I chose to come back to Kenya 11 years ago, I did an interview at the BBC under a pseudonym. Um, something had happened in Nigeria that really irked me. And I wrote anonymously to the BBC in London and told them, you know, I'm going to speak out as a gay person. And they asked me, do you see things changing in Kenya? And then I said, you know, not in my lifetime. And this was 11 years ago. 10 years, 11 years on, we've come a long way. We've come a long way to the fact that we have organizations that are Kenyan, run by Kenyans, fighting for the rights of Kenyans or any other sexual minority that is in Kenya. When we had our first meeting at the World Social Forum in um, 2006, um, they had allocated a space for us and uh, we promptly called it the Q Spot. We got lots of visits, we got lots of people asking to come and see, show us a gay, show us a lesbian, <laughs> you know, and people were like, these guys are normal. And there were, and there were, and there were pockets of people in, in, who were busy sharing our story. And Kenyans, there's a young man who came from Narok, and he said he'd heard about this on TV, and he said he had to come to Nairobi so that he could feel that he's not alone. We've come a long way. We're not yet home dry, we're not yet out of the woods. I've come out to my whole family. I've come out publicly. I'm not ashamed of who I am. 
But I remember when I launched the book three years, I called um, David Correa, who um, came to prominence being a came to prominence as being the first openly gay senatorial aspirant during the last election. I told David, dude, I'm scared. And he told me, Kevin, you don't have anything to worry about. You live on the good side of town. You don't have to go down to, to the common water point to get water or go to the kiosk next night to buy blue band or, or vegetables and everything. But I was still scared. I was scared for myself. I was scared for my family. But the book came out. And I was thrown out publicly, <laughs> you know, into that space as a queer man. They ask issues that we face every day. I may not face them directly, but there are lots of other Kenyans, and I'm sure Leonard and Kenagaido and Jerry will tell you about them. What do we face? We just want space. Space to be us, space to be me, without having to, to without living in fear of offending people or, or something. That's one of the issues. We need to have more spaces of security, and it's not, let's not leave it under the illusion it's, it's on this side of town. These spaces could be anywhere. These spaces could be not just in, in Nairobi. Security. Security is one of the things that we struggle with as, 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 as LGBTI individuals. But creating spaces where we feel space, uh, safe is one of the challenges, I would say. But I will reiterate, we've come a long way we've come a very long way. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And, and you said something that actually is very interesting, and maybe uh, I'll ask Muticia to elaborate maybe a, a bit more as, as well as yourself, Kevin. Um, you were emphasizing that it was good to see Kenyan LGBTI groups, local, basically, essentially local, right, local groups fighting for their own local people, you know? And, this goes, there's, there's a lot of criticism about the, the actions of international LGBTI organizations such as Outright, such as, um, I don't know, uh, the, the human, human Rights Watch, in terms of, of, of not actually getting the local context, uh, you know, coming, coming to a country and, 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 and I don't know, there's, there seems to be some, some perhaps conflict there, I don't know, Muticia, if, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, in terms of, of the, I guess, I'm asking about the relationship or the relationship between international rights groups who are fighting for LGBTI rights and local groups. Um, I'll, I'll try and answer the question, because it, it wasn't clear, and it's because it's a very muddy area of discussion. Generally, I believe that there's no one strategy or approach that can solve problems. And that's something that's, I believe, agreeable universally. And so the contribution of interna international agencies of various kinds, from international NGOs to international foundations to agencies like the UN, is critical to helping local communities around the world solve problems. Um, but I guess what emerges as a conflict is when local communities are denied the agency to also contribute to their problem definition and solutions. Mm -hmm. And that happens a lot when international agencies or international entities fail to recognize that there is no international intelligence. Um, someone could have international reach, but it's very important to recognize that intelligence is a very local thing because it's people who live through struggles that have a sharp diagnosis of um, Africans say, he who has a shoe knows where it pinches um, the most. Like it's, it's when you live through struggle, that's when you know. And I believe that there's a lot of progressive international entities that actually work closely with communities to define problems and look for solutions. And it's a strategy that's pretty sexy around the world. People like, like to say that they're community-led. But, but the question is, to what extent does it go from talk to action? Um, and often it doesn't go that far behind the, beyond the PR. Um, and relating to the work that I do, we all know that there's a lot of contribution that's going into sex worker and LGBTI health, for example, um, across the world. But even in a region like Eastern Africa, Uhai being a local fund that's only eight years old, um, 
is making more grants to communities that are running HIV programs that are led by gay men than the Global Fund and PEPFA combined, which is pretty depressing <laughs> to think that this international funding mechanisms do not, have not yet reached a place of genuine partnerships and collaborations with communities. So, um, that, but then at the same time, you can see that they're trying to grow to a place where they're making more contributions. Um, and if, if, you th if you think of the illustrations of challenges that Kevin pointed out, issues around creating safe space, issues around personal security, if funding mechanisms, if support is far from the people who are facing those problems, then it's not really efficient. Right. Yes, sorry, I, I guess uh, my question should have been clearer. I, I was trying to think of in which ways international LGBTI human rights organizations can help and in which ways they are, they are actually getting the way, you know? Um, uh, I, I was thinking in terms of u u in Uganda, uh, there was a lot of local activists who, who felt that they were making the situation in Uganda worse. So that, I was thinking of it from, from that perspective. But um, let me t pass it over to uh, Gaiso and also Nigeri and ask them a question. Um, in terms of your advocacy, Gaiso, do you, what kind of terminology uh, do, you, do you use when it comes to these issues? Is it LGBTI or what is, is, is there a way that you describe people that you think more uh, uh, captures better the situation in Kenya? Um, well, I, I think the term LGBTI as it is has actually been expanding over the years. So at the moment, we because what we want ultimately is inclusion and for gender, gender and sexual minorities to never feel as if they don't have a place or they don't have people that identify them and include them in their group. So at the moment would be LGBTIQ plus persons or sexual and gender minorities. I think that's the most ex inclusive um, term that we have right now. Yeah. Okay. Which would you think works fine? Yes, mm -hmm. I believe it works fine because um, to, to try and split up the categories of people has often created strife in terms of whether or not they feel they have been included in the conversation. And, um, and finally, in Nigeria, um, you talk. Uh, you said in your introductory remarks that you brought many cases to court. Can you describe a little bit of that work? Um, uh, what are the cases you were thinking about, and what? Just a little bit of, of how that process went. Um, so, the the, the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, the organization that I work for, uh, is um, basically like a, a group of lawyers who identify as queer and who like sort of vision that the only the best way to change the, the world was to use the law because that's basically what we know. I mean that's actually all we know. So we so I mean we we, we started with the with the legal aid work and with the advocacy work and we realized at some point we needed to make a decision on what on what um, what strategy would be the most effective and would would um would uh, would give us like results uh, in a way that's that's not only sustainable but in a way that's enforceable, right? So we thought, um, why not why not actually do litigation litigation and particularly do uh, strategic litigation? So what we've done is that we, in 2013 we tried to register our organization as a National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, and of course we got um, rejections by the the NGO board, which is the the board in Kenya that. That, regist that registers non-profits. So, I, I mean, and, and we had a bit of back and forth. We had like about six or seven letters that we wrote to them and we kept being denied. So we went to court, we went to the Constitutional Court and filed um, a suit um, suing the government of Kenya and the, and the, the NGO board refusing to register us. And, and also why, because the reasons they had given was basically just nonsense that um, you know same-sex marriage is not allowed in Kenya which is not we, what we had asked in the first place and that uh, homosexual uh, homose are illegal which is also not why we were forming the organization for in the first place we weren't like telling people go have homosexual sex mm -hmm. um, so then yeah so, the, so then we went to court in 2013 and in 2015 so basically we went to court to sue for registration and in 2015 the court um, 
we got a decision that allowed us, uh, in which the, the court stated that uh, the definition of any person, uh, as stated in the, in the Kenyan constitution, with regards to association, includes all people in Kenya, regardless of their sexual orientation and gender, gender identity. And this was a big deal, because in the first, for the first time uh, in Kenyan, I don't know, jurisprudence, in legislature, in, in whatever uh, sort of uh, courts, there was an actual mention that LGBTQ people were validly Kenyan and were part of the people that were envisioned and protected in the constitution. So th this was a really big deal. But then, of course, the government still refused to register us and, um, and filed an appeal. And so we are now currently in the process of, uh, of, of, of appeal. So then the, the second matter which we sued the government is that because there's a law in the Kenyan uh, penal code that section 162 to 165 that basically criminalizes consensual sex uh, between male adults in private, which is now yeah. what people use to say that homosexuality is illegal in Kenya, which that, I mean, that phrase is, is incorrect, but basically this is what uh, is, is used to justify the, the feeling that homosexuality is in, illegal in Kenya. Yeah. So what, what um, policemen and uh, what magistrates in some courts would do is that if anyone was suspected of being gay or, I don't know, just, just seeming some sort of um, queer, uh, they would be arrested and charged under this law and to prove, this, and to prove that these people were actually homosexual, then they would have, they would um, do what, what is called forced anal testing um, uh, as, a, as a test to prove whether this person was uh, having anal sex or whether consensual, yeah, basically right. this person was having anal sex with, with, with another person in private. So we went to court to um, question the legality of the, of, of the test and, and to ask them why and what, how, how would an anal test prove that someone was having Right. you know, um, sex in, in, in private and, and all of these things. So we sued the government in 2015, in November, and we got a ruling last year that was unfavorable, and the, the High Court uh, upheld the use of uh, forced annual testing uh, in yeah. Kenya. So that was a, big, uh, a bit of a setback, but then we have uh, filed our appeal, and so we're, we're, still, we're still going through the court process. And then the third matter, the, 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 third, um, re, the, the third time that we sued the government was actually last year, and we sued the government to um, asking them to decriminalize uh, forced, uh, I mean, to de decriminalize consensual sex in private, just basically to scrap this part of the penal code that ma make it illegal for people to have consensual sex uh, between male in pri males in private. And uh, the reasons that we presented to the court is that this, uh, this law was discriminatory, and outside of that, then it created so many loopholes for, and, and it allowed and justified uh, the violence that we continue to face on the daily, the discrimination against um, people because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, and it just continued to inform the homophobic uh, rhetoric in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, right. in the country. So we just got a bench assigned. Uh, so in, it, when you go to the high court, you have to get a... Um, uh, in the constitutional bench, uh, in the constitutional court, you get a three-judge bench. So we got that um, uh, assigned. So we're hoping to proceed to the hearings uh, in the near future. So all of you are welcome. It's a, it's a public, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an open court. So anyone is is is, is allowed to come and listen. Okay, thank you, Nijari. And I think that's a good point in terms of a, a lot of these laws. They don't they don't necessarily criminalizing homosexuality. They're criminalizing same-sex sexual activity, okay. which is a, a, this is a difference, but of course that very law is used to essentially target uh, okay. people who are suspected to be gay, and this is why I think personally that uh, gender non-conforming people, their, their protection is also fundamental. Uh, so, okay, so now that each of the panelists have said a few words, uh, let me open it up to questions uh, for the audience, uh, whether for any of the panelists or for myself. Any questions? Okay, uh, should I ask the next question while you guys think of the next one? <laughs> okay, all right. So um, let me ask any, any or, or maybe all the, all the panelists, what would be helpful uh, for you? In, what do you think the UN can and should do when it comes to these issues? What, is there any specific action that you, you would like to see the UN take? Um, 
I can think of one thing. Um, the, the UN has a lot of access privileges to government and to community leadership across this country, but across every country that you have presence. And it would be beautiful if you could support the communities everywhere you work to actually mainstream um, issues of diversity and inclusion, to ensure that the leadership of community solutions looks as diverse and as equal as the world looks like, to make sure that you promote equal opportunities and services for everyone, and that you're always pushing communities yeah. to see that we are diverse people and that we come in different shapes and sizes, um, literally. Uh, I, I feel that I feel that the more people talk about diversity and inclusion, the better the world is. Yeah. Um, and there's an access that you have. And I know that you know that this room has some of the most privileged people in Nairobi. Um, you may not be all truly wealthy, but the privilege you have by the positions that you have and the spaces that you can talk, get to and the people that actually listen to you could really use um, more sensitization on diversity and inclusion. And therefore, the work that you're doing at the UN Globe is very important mm -hmm. because it would be nice if you actually had a culture of inclusion and diversity. I, yeah. I, I, I'm sad to hear that you didn't have out staff to sit in this panel. Um, yeah. Part of what was exciting about me coming to the UN was actually to meet the gay folk at the UN. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, it'd be nice to find out um, who are the queer people here. Um, I hope that the next time that this dialogue is here, that you yeah. could actually talk among yourselves. Um, but for all, um, um, this is not a question, but um, I'm in a good mood today. For all the gay people in the room, all the trans people in the room, all the lesbian oh, yeah. people in the room, um, just know that you have a lot of love in the city and there's a lot of stubborn, resilient hardheads who are making sure that they can actually live and be because there's no other way to be. And um, I hope that you have a safe working place. But, but just know that if you reach out to the city, there's a lot of us doing incredible work of making this country um, more beautiful and more yeah. lovable. I'm um, just to add on to what Leonard said. I think maybe is to recognize that even within your own structures, that there are communities in countries that people might think where homosexuality, uh, homosexual acts are illegal. You know, if you know of people, I mean, just say, you know, if you happen to be queer, there is a community. There are movements, but there are also communities. There, there is a burgeoning and fervent right. community within Nairobi that is open and welcome to everybody else. And I think also create safe spaces for yourselves. Right. Create space, safe spaces for colleagues. And it was interesting when you said that you're hoping to see a black lesbian be, you know, at that level of DG in 30 years' time. I'm sl slightly sad when you said that. Yeah. 30 years, man. Well, maybe, maybe five years. I don't know. Why not now? Why not now? No, Why, but, not okay. now? Right. Why not now? Yeah. Do you oh, know yeah, you're with yeah. a bunch of activists who will push? Why not yeah. now? Create safe spaces for yourselves, for your colleagues. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a good point, you know. Um, and we are advocating to see an openly queer, gay, lesbian, whichever category you want to use, serve as an undersecretary general. And we are doing this advocacy, and we want to see it now. When I meant a G3 going to a USG, which is an, stands for undersecretary general, it was said mostly because the reality in the UN system is that career, you know, for, Going up the career ladder takes a really long time, so this, that, that was that. But I think you're very happy now. And I, going back to what Motish said, uh, I think the UN is doing a bit, incorporating into its programmatic work, looking after the needs of LGBTI people. I think where the UN maybe can do more, it's not only in that, you know, they can really do a bit more than, than what they're doing. But uh, I think also when it comes to engaging with, with governments, right? Um, that kind of engagement, I think the UN could be a bit more engaged in, I guess, is, 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 um, is what I'm thinking of. Okay, um, any questions?
questions. Okay, all right, well, look. look. Hi, thanks right. very much. It's, it's, it's been very enlightening for me. Um, I think tolerance is, you know, it's an interesting t concept, but it's very passive, right? So you as activists, do you have any requests or advice to the straight community to say this is what you guys can do to help us feel more welcome? Like creating a safe space, fine, you know, we can, and when we're asked to support, we're happy to support, but there should be something that's a little bit more active that we can do. Thanks. Any advice for allies or straight, I guess, identified people? Um, I would say he, he set out a couple of agenda yeah. for inclusion that the UN Globe is championing. Um, if queer people at the UN office in Nairobi cannot sit at this panel, they probably will not champion those issues here. Um, and it would be difficult if those issues are synonymous with gay people or trans people. So if straight allies could be the ones that actually champion those policy discussions, then that would not only give those issues a better chance of seeing the light of day, but it would create a welcoming environment because then the people who are being championed would feel safer and more welcome, I think. All right, uh, there were two hands up. I, I guess we'll just ask, just ask, yeah, ask and then you, you ask the question. We'll, you, we're bunching the questions together, so I just wanna say. My name is Rolando and my question is, what's your overall feeling of the upcoming elections in Kenya? Will it be a good platform to advance the rights of LGBT or will it be more of a challenging platform to pursue what we're fighting for. I'm just getting your feelings about the upcoming elections. Do you see it as a positive platform to advance your rights or there's so much anxieties about this, this upcoming event? Thanks. Okay. And then uh, would you ask your question as well? Uh, my name is Ke Fang Yang from UNESCO. Uh, I think first of all, we need to celebrate uh, the good news from Taiwan today. There's a top called uh, Rules of Same-Sex Marriage uh, Legal. Uh, I think uh, it's the first place in Asia, so we really need to uh, celebrate it. And uh, I think instead of asking what uh, should UN do, we need to think about what sh uh, we should do. Um, I mean, as a UN staff, we're supposed to you know, lead by examples. Um, so like today's uh, this event, I think it's great. And uh, staff, um, especially you know, whose work is highly in involved in gender, um, you know, everyone is supposed to come. And, uh, you know, kind of, especially uh, like the, the leading uh, organization like UN Globe, I'm not familiar with that. My previous duty station uh, was in uh, Bangkok. And um, I think the most activities that you organize is mostly, you know, like social events and the party and drinking. I don't know like how we can, you know, mobilize um, uh, our, you know, resources to take action really uh, in terms of mainstreaming gender, but how can we think about other dimension like LGBTI? Thanks. Okay. Um, I guess, Kevin, you, you just came back from a training very much related to the elections. Do you want to say something about that? Um, yeah, um, I'm actually training uh, aspiring women and youth leaders um, on media skills. And this issue did come up this morning where people are like, don't bring up the LGBTI issue, it's, it's contentious. We live in a conservative country, it could be dangerous. I think at this point in time, we haven't seen it yet, I hope it doesn't come up, but people usually use that against candidates, you know. Um, but if it's not gonna be an LGBT issue, it's gonna be another issue that's gonna be used, especially we, we're seeing it with, with female candidates you know, where in some parts of Kenya, if you're not married, you know, you don't stand a chance. You know, even in parts that are hom homogeneous communities, you might marry from the wrong part of the hom homogeneous community. Those are the challenge, challenges facing. Should we bring it up right now during the election? I think we should use the constitution to champion the rights for all during the election. That's just my, my point of view, where we, our rights are enshrined in that. And for those of and, the, and for people who use us as scapegoats um, to speak against LGBTI, we we have the constitution. I think as we approach the election, let's let's use to, let's use that to protect us and for those who those who don't have a voice. 
Yeah, I'll, maybe you know, I'll, I'll ask the two lawyers in our in our panel any thoughts on on on, on what Kevin just said. Um, well, I agree with Kevin um, in as far as he spoke of the Constitution and enshri enshrining um, our fundamental human rights within the Bill of Rights. That that does unequivocally speak for all Kenyans within the borders of this country and outside as well. Um, that being said, we are very aware of how um, volatile the election period may become and we proceed with caution because the effect could end up being very um, regressive in terms of when the conversation is not propelled in the direction that we would want it to go and where homophobia continues to be the theme that is the, the reigning theme. So I think that we must keep doing what we're doing, but at the same time, we also must proceed with caution when it comes to the election period, because as he said, a lot of the times the tendency to use LGBTI issues as to demonize LGBTI persons and LGBTI issues and try to pass it off as a Western concept and um, encourage homophobia as a protection of our culture or our traditional values is something that has been done too much and for too long. So to proceed in a strategic manner is, is truly the only way we can ensure that we continue in a positive manner. Okay. Um, back to, to you guys, any questions that anyone wants to ask? Um, I, on the second question, um, I, I think that how to personalize your own activism. I think that you should definitely familiarize yourself as a pet, just individually familiarize yourself with the politics around sexual minority issues. I think that's the number one thing that you start with. You may not necessarily at the moment identify as an ally, but I think the first step is making sure that you come out to people and tell them that I believe in the equality of all persons and I seek to enforce that in my daily life, in my daily living. So where you witness discrimination, then you are constantly there to raise your voice and say that I do not accept this for this particular group of people. I think that's the first step from there on. And if you're in a position of power or in a position where you can influence policies or even encourage discussion on, or conversation about these issues, then that should be one of the things that you add onto your agenda. If you're in charge of a workplace, for instance, should it be your prerogative or the, the general UN prerogative to come up and say this is our anti-discrimination policy and this is what we say. I think that it should be on everyone, on all of us. If you work, if you walk into a workplace and you feel as if your um, colleague does not feel safe to come out or to express themselves in the way that they should, I think through your personal interactions with them, then that should be the rhetoric every day that we are accepting, we want you here, and if you have privilege as as Morticia said, then you can use it in your own ways to influence um, people's attitudes every day. Uh, let me ask you something, uh, Nigerian and Gaitha. You, you, Gaitha, you were say, just saying that, um, that you know, when people say, are, argue that homosexuality is a Western concept or you know it goes against our culture, etc. What's your counter argument? How do you reply to that? Um, I think always our answer is uh, homosexuality has been uh, has been for as long as human beings were, and I think the thing that was that's actually a Western concept is homophobia, not not homosexuality. And we've we've actually taken time to speak to the people who came before us, to our grandmothers and great grandmothers, and they they spoke specifically, um, I think, in, 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 a, in, a, in a culture specific um, setting. And particularly, so my, my, my mom is Kikuyu, so I was brought up in the Kikuyu community. And, and, and one of the things that they, they had at that time is that they, they uh, at the time when my grandmother and my great grandmother were kids, is that they had uh, people who would, uh, who would um, bend gender. So there were people who were, I mean, who were physically, say, male or physically female, but were, were seen to bend, bend, um, to bend genders. They were called um, oneki. And then these people were then seen as um, occupying a, a, a level of spirituality that, that, was, that was between um, 
where where the ancestors were and where the humans were. So like they they, they sort of like bridged the gaps between um, two, uh, two worlds, the the, mm -hmm. the you know the, right. the actual world and, and and the spiritual world. And they were given so much respect then, and they were allowed to take lovers of whatever gender they presented at the time. And, and this is not only for my communities, it's for very many communities, is that people are not really separated by who they fell in love with or who they, they slept with or who they, I don't know, who they courted. There were, I mean, there was a lot of, there was a lot of acceptance. And, and, I, and I think, and I've had this conversation with my friends over time, and we're trying to figure out where do we get most homophobia? Is it bef uh, with the generation that is our parents or the generation that is our grandparents or great-grandparents? And it's always the generation that um, grew into Christianity, into a space of colonization where there was now that separation of, okay, so um, men who uh, love men or who sleep with men are bad people. But, but, but the people who were before them, their parents and their grandparents before them, they were like, these this things are there, these things have been in our community. So I, I don't, I, again, keep saying that uh, homophobia is what is, what, is, what is Western, it's what was brought by the colonial laws and, 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 you know, and colonization and the introduction of Christianity and all of those things. Uh, before that, I don't think there was that space for discrimination because of the, the people that we love. Um, any questions from the floor? Oh, we have a question here. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ilya and I work with the UN Population Fund here in Kenya. Um, I was just watching, a few months ago, I was watching this uh, Al Jazeera program called Head to Head, a debate program, and one of the current Kenyan presidential candidates was, were on that show. And I remember they were discussing the laws that you were talking about before. and. Um, in a reference to the discussion of the issue of homosexuality, he, he said, I just don't think it's African. And to me, that kind of shows that the issue is, is more deeply rooted than just discussion of mm -hmm. laws and the legality of those laws, but it's a, it's a, it's a politic of identity. So just thinking, what, what kind of approach do you as activists think is the appropriate to that kind of mentality? Uh, we're going to ask. Uh, yeah. Yes, hi, my name is Leticia. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for coming and making this happen. And I think indeed, um, like Muticia, I think your name is, uh, the UN is sometimes far away from inclusion. And in the more than 10 years that I've been here in, on this compound working, I think it's the very first event um, of that kind. So thanks for making that happen. And I wanted to tell Kevin, thank you very much. By chance, I actually read your book only last month, and I was touched upon by, by those stories of you know, very young people who never saw a chance on how to come out um, in school or in, in their you know, closest family and, and, and left it inside until they became adults. And then only through help of friends or nowadays more of those networks available um, could, could find you know, um, a network or a home to come out. My question was, what, is, um, what are your networks, your organizations, or you as individuals, what is your experience with schools, no matter if primary or rather secondary schools, boarding schools? Is there a way that, that you've been able to reach out to the teachers' community to, to make aware or to, to raise more regarding um, awareness, human rights in this regard, um, advocacy in general, because it seems that for young people in particular, it is so difficult in, in Kenya to, to be able to, to find their way. Thanks. Okay. I guess, um, let's uh, uh, and try to, uh, Kevin, do you want to say something about the schools, uh, or maybe Nigeri or Gaito, or the education aspect of this? I think the aspect of schools is, is, is highly sensitive, especially in, in, in Kenya, in this region. Um, I remember in Uganda, someone had just tried to put in some sex, uh, uh, there was a publication that went out to the schools about sexual education and they did mention you know same gender loving individuals and that book was promptly withdrawn because people use it to say we're trying to recruit in individuals 
into homosexuality, and that, that's used often. Um, I will admit, I, I don't have that experience in, in, in reaching out to schools, nor have I worked with them. But through the book, I hope people will get to know that their stories, their individuals like themselves. Um, growing up as a queer man in Kenya, as a gay man, was, was very lonely. I often felt I was the only gay in the village when I was 16, you know. Um, and I hope the book, if, if it can be shared somehow, if stories can be told to other individuals who are struggling with their sexuality, I just want guys to know that they're not alone, that what they feel is, is normal, is African, is love, is part of the process. And I hope Invisible does that. Thank you for your kind words about Invisible. And I hope there are more narratives that are Kenyan, there are more narratives that are African. There are more narratives from communities where homosexuality or homosexual acts are frowned upon. Because those are the narratives that people need to hear. And I hope that they open more doors. And I, I, thank you. And I do want to say a few things about, in terms of your question, uh, in terms of this comment that was made, uh, I guess, on, on uh, Al Jazeera, you said, on homosexuality. And I guess um, Part of it is, what does homosexuality mean? You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it, beca it has become such a contentious word that can mean so many different things to different people. Um, whether it means, I guess, yeah, yeah, I guess that's the question. You know, what, what, what you know, um, what has it come to signify, and what did that? How would we? How do LGBTI or queer people interpret that word? And how do and how do um, people who have, uh, I guess a very negative attitude towards that word, you know. I guess it's, 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 a, it's a, I guess what I'm trying to say, it's, it's a very, um, it's a word that does not signify one exact thing. It, it's a word that can be used by some as a weapon and it can be, it's a word that can be used by others as, a, as, a, as an empowerment, as a, as a word of empowerment. So I guess that's, it's, that's a bit of the conflict that, that I personally see. I don't know if any of the panelists have something to say about that word in particular. Um, not, 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 not in direct response to what you said, but I, I had a different view to your question. Um, what, I'm guessing this is prime, former Prime Minister Ayla who spoke. Um, what he said is very similar to what the current president Kenyatta said when Obama was here and said that homosexuality is really not an issue for us right now. It's, those statements are not surprising because throughout this continent, which we have chosen to have um, the great, um, what's his name, Zimbabwe? Mugabe. Mugabe become the president of the African Union. Um, what's happening across the continent is that there's a legacy of corruption and impunity that is just deeply entrenched throughout the continent, but at the same time, I think Africa has one of the most like, sophisticated and strong civil society movements that are working to create environments of accountability to government transparency, democratization, and human rights discourse. And that civil society environment is working in direct conflict with this governments of impunity that are trying to stamp their authority. And the easiest way to invalidate or question the relevance of the civil society movement in Africa is to theme everything that they do as Western. And it's a very lazy way of thinking, but it's an approach that is so textbook and so uniform across the continent. Like if there's civil society work around land governance or land accountability or human rights or women's advancement or LGBT rights, it's Western. It's not Africa. It's not a priority. And what the governments are now doing, and I'm sure um, with a global scale you have at you and you can see, is that they're using infrastructural development and healthcare um, infrastructure conversations. Like infrastructure is a smoke screen for avoiding conversations on human rights and democracy. And so it, everyone is gonna build a train and everyone wants to launch new roads and improve buildings and all this goes to respond to how strongly civil society is organizing in the continent. And Jari gave good examples about how one organization is causing heat to government. And there's so many other examples within the LGBTI movement and also outside the movement. I mentioned that I work for a foundation that supports both LGBTI work and sex worker work. 
our sex worker communities in Kenya are also working towards tabling a petition to decriminalize sex work in Kenya, um, which is quite progressive, conversations that are also happening in South Africa. And so this, this, this of course, makes governments uncomfortable. Um, and so I, I, don't, I actually don't bother much about that response, one, because it's lazy, and two, because it indicates a lot of fear for how strongly mobilized civil society is in the continent. Um, I also want to comment about um, Letitia's question um, on the school system and how we may try in the future to penetrate into those spaces. So as Kevin said, it's a very um, sensitive issue that we have had a lot of problems trying to get into. One, because as minorities, it, it's very easy to, um, as he said, just put the umbrella, ter umbrella term that we're just trying to recruit them or we have no right to go near school kids because they're under 18, so since they have not reached the age of majority, they are not able to make sound decisions by themselves. So that is one of the issues that, that arises when we are dealing with the school system. In addition to that, I think it needs to be clear that the school system as it exists in Kenya is a direct um, combination of inherited colonial structures as well as the religious system as we inherited it from the missionaries. So because of that, the homophobic attitudes that exist within the school systems are particularly bad and the continued prosecution of kids that are coming out or that are trying to explore the sexuality is rampant and goes unquestioned because the idea is that we're just trying to enforce morality. So that idea, I suppose, will continue um, throughout the next few years, but an interesting angle would be to start having conversations on human rights, and another one has been through sexual education, which has also been a bit problematic. But to start conversations on human rights, I think, is so, so important, and it's a wonderful entry point, because then you have a variety of issues that you can discuss, and various groups can be tackled, as well as giving education on what the general concept of human rights is, then you start to discuss issues as they are localized or, or as they exist within um, different communities. So I think that would be the way to go in and also through um, social activism, as Kevin said, reading books or finding literature that allows you to identify with someone else's experience as an LGBTI um, young individual. And I would just say, you know, in terms of education, and, but not also about different cultures, I, I know of no educational system that will teach its children values other than, you know, always look after other people, always care about others, always be, you know, a decent human being in the future, be a, contribute to society, contribute to the world. I think every, every education system in the world teaches this to children, and I, I personally don't think cultures, and there's any culture in the world that um, preaches or teaches it or tells people to hate a particular group of people. I think what is needed is to ensure that when we're talking about equality, when we're talking about inclusion, when we're talking about respect for human beings, we also are talking about respect for people of different sexual or gender identities. I mean, I think it's not like we need to teach people how to love, we just need to teach people how to expand that love to include more people because the basics are already there. Educational systems have that basics. It's just a matter of, of, of changing that mindset so that it, open, it opens it up to many different kinds of people that previously were not included. So that, that's what I would say. Um, we're running out of time. Any last questions before move? Okay, let's, yeah. Okay, my question is, uh, let's bring it back to the UN space and also to the staff members. Um, I'm sitting here probably as a Christian or as a Muslim and uh, when this topic comes up I feel that it violates my values. What's the advice you can give to let's say straight staff members how to deal with this conflict, the God element and the LGBTI element? How can they harmonize that? Was that a question to me? <laughs> Open to well, I, I could try and answer. I identify as a gay Christian man. I fellowship at Mavuno, and 
I am openly, <laughs> I'm openly gay and I'm out even to my Bible study group. Um, and I, I, I personally do not see a conflict between my identity as a Christian man and my identity as a gay man. It's um, nuanced my experience of homosexuality because I'm this unpopular breed of gay men who actually believe in faithfulness and monogamy, which, um, yeah, it's very unusual. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's, I, I feel that God wants me to be faithful and to honor my body and not... Um, and so that's, that's my own interpretation yeah. of faith. And, but I say that because I think different people have different interpretations of faith and experiences of faith. And the same way we all have different interpretations of the law and experience of law and policy. But if we recognize that the decisions that we make as individuals mm -hmm. should not get in the way of the decisions other people make from whatever place that they form their values, then we, we have a better world. Because my interpretation of my Christian faith does not dictate how I interact with other people. Because I recognize that other people form their values differently. Um, I, yeah. yeah, I don't want to add to that. I, I mean, I, sorry. I say this all the time, you know. The human being is such a complex being, you know, with all, so many passions, so many likes, so many dislikes. And the problem that comes come with someone saying, I am gay or I am trans is that all of a sudden that's all you become. This gay identity becomes the essence of who you are. Whereas what we also need to emphasize is that a man can be, like you said, Muticia, and uh, you, you were, you were, Kimani, you were pointing at, you know, a man can be religious, you know, a woman can be very proud of, 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 of her race or ethnicity and be gay at the same time and can be many other things as well as be a human being who who wants to become a, a, I don't know, like a, 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 fire, a, a fire person or, or, or a mayor or, you know, it's, it's the complexity of the human being that I hope is never lost when we talk about sexual or gender identities, when we talk about LGBTI, and I think we always have to remember that. And, you know, uh, when it comes to diversity and inclusion, it's not about necessarily about, um, you know, making sure that um, people with disabilities, and it's not like creating silos, but it's creating that behind that category, behind that uh, label, there's a, there's a very complex human being. I think I also want to add that I think that a lot of time as a lot of times as human beings we we use things such as religion or politics or um, our, our levels of um, I don't know education to basically justify positions that we hold regardless of these things that we're using to justify. Uh, personally, I think uh, some of the harshest words I've ever had directed at me have been from people who consider themselves uh, very religious and also some of the kindest words I've, and the, some of you know the, some of the most solid support I've received has been from people who also consider themselves uh, religious when I came out and I and I, and I came out in a like I thought I had a coming out then I had like a an ultra coming out uh, on, <laughs> on on media I think the people who and, and and by then I was like I was like I was already like an activist that like I'd done a few things with my life, um, so people would call my mother and my mother is very she's very she's very Christian she's very born again, I, I, like Kenyans in the room you know what's like being born again is and like she she wears like the the church women some guild something some like so basically she was she's that kind of a person. And a lot of people called her, you know, telling her how can you be saved while your child is on media saying that men should marry men. And, like, that's the farthest thing from what I was saying, you know, like, and, like, there was so much criticism and, 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 and it broke her because of the things that I know my mother loves, there's, I think, her children, then there's Jesus. Like, like you know, so to use her Jesus to attack her was, like, completely breaking her. But then... I think how we got through that and how she personally got, got through that is that she had other people who were Christians like her who served in the stage like holding her hand and saying your child and you know your Jesus says that we should love each other and that we if the, she needs to be forgiven you need to forgive her because she is your child and if Christ you know loves sinners and we're all sinners then you know what's like 
what else is holding you back? So I think the the people who broke her were her fellow Christians, and the people who picked her up, her up and mended her were also her Christian friends. And and I know that this uh, this cuts across uh, all religions. We can use religion to justify whatever whatever we want to do or whatever we want to say. It's just it's it's because it's there. It doesn't religion wouldn't. Um, won't defend itself from your opinion or whatever you're using it to justify. So I think, I, I, I don't think that any, I don't think any such things, any such beliefs uh, should be an issue uh, that, that, that would make me feel that I can't exist in a space and exist as a, my true authentic self. You know, so I'm here, I'm, I'm very queer, and I accept that you're Christian and whatever, but also I don't think that this is, this is going to, go, to cause any conflict between us. Okay, um, I guess just very, the very last question and then we'll end this. Yeah, okay, thank you. Maybe a question and the, and the proposal. Uh, Alexander Juras, I'm in charge at UNEP for civil society relations. First, may, maybe a comment. I, I think anybody who cannot tolerate lay or lesbian, uh, etc., should maybe think, rethink whether the United Nations is the right working place. Mm -hmm. uh, because the United Nations is about tolerance, uh, these are, these are core values, and if some are can, that's the same uh, as with gender, gender equality. If you think men and women are not equal, maybe the UN is not the place where you uh, should be. Now, of course, that's a process. Some people can change their mind, and I think there the UN can do more. Now, I think we are flooded. Uh, and very well so with trainings on gender equality and gender bias. No, but I hear rarely, I don't even remember at all, no, that we have similar trainings, awareness raisings on the issues we discussed today. And that can be maybe one of the concrete outcomes uh, of these meetings today, that you uh, globe, and I'm, I'm happy to assist also, talk with uh, the people in our training unit and say we identified that there is really a lack of awareness that even people don't understand that tolerance also in this field is covered by the UN, uh, by the UN core values which we all should, should represent. So let's raise awareness, let's have some training courses uh, uh, on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, when I, at the beginning, when I said about diversity and inclusion and how UN Globe is pushing for diversity and inclusion, it's not necessarily under, you know, like just different special rights groups, but, it, you know, like you said, you know, what, are, what, what do all the UN staff members share in common? I mean, you know, we, we share very common values, you know, a, a certain belief that this organization matters, that we need an organization who, who fights for others, you know, and, and I think that can be the uniting the uniting theme of all staff members, and and like you said, you know, just re, uh, to to uh, these are the values that the UN staff member has should have, and we always are gonna always push for for people to live up to these values. Um, anyways, um, this is just the beginning. Can I just say something yeah. small? Um, I think I'll go back to the whole safe spaces thing, but also dialogue like this. Yeah. Um, we were at a meeting last week with uh, Kenyan businesses that are talking about how to make. Um, LGBT, making the business case for LGBT issues. You know, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a first for us, you know, and this is a first for you yourselves, and I think you should applaud yourselves for doing that. But I think, like Jerry said last week, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that we could, we could just pick to bring about inclusion. You know, like last week, we had the International Day Against Homophobia and bi uh, Biphobia and Transphobia. Why not celebrate that even within this space? Why not acknowledge that even as we approach World AIDS Day on the 1st of, of, 1st of December? Is it inclusive? Does it cover all the beautiful colors of the rainbow in acknowledging that? And questions of faith, those, it is an important question, but there, I was at a meeting last week of Kenyans who struggle with the church but still have faith and, what, and have been talking about trans issues and how to deal with that within their faith. People are moving, people are growing, and people realize that faith is inclusive. All right, thank you so much. Uh, you know, we, we're going to wrap this up. This is just, like you said, uh, Kevin, in terms of dialogue, this is just the beginning of the dialogue. Uh, UN Globe will definitely be pushing through many different means for this dialogue to continue. I'm very happy that the four of you came here to initiate this dialogue with us. and. And we will keep working towards sustaining this dialogue. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming here. Thank you.